I think we should get started. Uh, during the presentation, if you have any questions, there's a little thing called a Q&A tab. I highly recommend that you click it and you type in your questions. Uh, let's keep them civil, folks, and no name calling. Uh, good morning, if that's where you are. My name is Michael Thomas. I'm the Director of Business Development here at Bebop Technology. And today, we're going to show you some great technology. Not only uh, are we going to show you Bebop, but we're going to show you a fantastic partnership that Bebop has with Gray Meta. Uh, if you're not familiar with Gray Meta, they have the Iris player that allows you to do QC in various, uh, in various ways with various media types. And I'm thrilled to be able to uh, welcome Greg Cox, who will be showing that after the Bebop presentation. Um, everything we're doing today is live, and uh, again, if you have any questions, please put them in the question and answer tab, uh, and we'll answer those at the very end. Also, we are recording this, so this will be available for posterity, so please be honest, and uh, we'll shoot that link out afterwards. So, without any further ado, let's get started. Uh, again, my name is Michael, and the first thing we're going to do is show Bebop Technology. Uh, Bebop Technology uh, is a startup, been around for about four years, and what we specialize in is running creative applications in the cloud. Uh, that means giving you OS access to the cloud to run all the apps that you love to work with. Not only is that creative apps, but we're also talking about apps that facilitate your workflow. That means things like, oddly enough, Gray Meta's Iris Player, which allows you to do QC in the cloud. Now, on Bebop, uh, we spin up virtual machines in, instance, uh, in places around the world. We geolocate where we spin up these virtual machines to be in a geography near you. The, the reason we do this is the closer that you are to a data center, the faster the machine is going to appear to perform because latency is cut down. Because of this, Bebop has relationships with Amazon or AWS, uh, Google, uh, also known as GCP, or Microsoft Azure, and we really don't have a good acronym for Azure, so I'm sorry. But on those three cloud platforms, we can run all of these different applications, and we enjoy great relationships with companies like Gray Meta, and also Adobe and their entire Creative Cloud suite, plus Autodesk, and as you may have heard at NAB, uh, Avid will be welcomed back to our platform uh, in a couple months here. So you'll be able to run any of those applications uh, on Bebop, in any one of those three clouds. Let's move on from there. So long story short is that when you run Bebop, when you run applications on Bebop, you have access to edit media files, to create and alter VFX, all on shared storage in the cloud. So this means your entire team can harness the power of these compute systems, of these storage systems in the various cloud platforms and leverage those to get your business done. Uh, the fantastic thing is that this isn't something you just buy and it languishes. It's something that you pay on a monthly basis or a quarterly basis so you can ramp up and scale down as you need. So if you need to bring on additional VFX artists or editors or creatives, you can bring them on for a month or two and then scale it back. And we give you the metrics on how those systems are used so you can better plan for what's going to happen next month and next year. And we do this all around the globe. So if you have folks overseas, if you have folks here in the States, all of those folks can create off the data centers that are near where they are located. Bebop is composed of four main uh, portions. First off, we have the cloud platform, and that's basically what we tie everything together. Uh, spinning up a virtual machine in the cloud is not that easy. If you've ever tried it, it can be pretty daunting. What we've done is take the, the, the work out of that. We make it easy to click a few buttons, spin up a virtual machine, and work on that virtual machine without having to provision everything on your own. And we give you those metrics. That's the cloud platform. We also have something called Rocket Transfer. Rocket Transfer allows us to send media from on-prem up to your cloud du jour or from your cloud du jour down to where your local machine is. We also can transfer between clouds and between locations. This means that any media that you're working with is uh, going to be available to folks anywhere else that you're working with. And we do this via rocket transfer. And the great thing is that there's no 
uh, uh, usage charges, meaning we're not dinging you for every gigabyte or terabyte you transfer. Uh, so that can make media migration that much easier and that much less expensive. One of the most cool features that, that Bebop has is what we call over the shoulder or OTS. As I'm looking at the attendee list, I see quite a few editors. And as editors, you know the pain of having a producer or director or someone sitting behind you in the edit suite wanting to drive, wanting to grab the mouse, wanting to uh, make an edit here or make an edit there, or dare I say they snap their fingers and expect you to cut directly on that snap. What OTS allows you to do is the editor, the creative, can work on a timeline and share that screen with anyone else who's on Bebop. The, that other user can then view the screen but can't make changes. So it's the best of both worlds. You get the real-time feedback, you're watching the same thing, but they can't change anything on your screen. Plus, we add audio. So now instead of having to do a screen share and then make a call on your phone, everything is done through one connection. So it makes collaboration that much easier. And lastly, we have the managed services portion of Bebop, which adds another layer of simplicity to utilizing Bebop. That's a, that allows us to set up your IP schema. This allows uh, us to uh, keep tabs on everything uh, your systems are doing to ensure that you have the best experience possible. And all of this is available through Bebop. And again, uh, I know I'm going through a lot of information, so if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A uh, window in the uh, webinar. Here is a very base diagram of how Bebop works. First, we have a local machine uh, that can be a Mac, it can be a PC, it can be a desktop, it can be a laptop. It doesn't matter because the Bebop host application, I'm sorry, the Bebop client application runs on both platforms. You would then use our rocket transfer to get the media up to high performance storage. A majority of the storage that you find in cloud platforms uh, really isn't conducive to media editing and media manipulation. So we've provisioned high performance storage in all of the data centers. So when you upload media, it's instantly available and it's gonna give you the performance you need. We also use something called PC over IP. So that's another acronym for you to learn. PC over IP wipes the floor with those traditional screen sharing applications uh, like remote desktop or dare I say the free version of TeamViewer. PC over IP delivers you color accuracy. It delivers you full frame rate. It also delivers mouse and keyboard control. Uh, so you are uh, so you're actively looking at the workstation in the cloud that's running these creative applications. And it also allows for multiple screens, up to four HD screens. So you can have your bin monitor and your timeline monitor and uh, run all the apps that you need in the cloud on as many monitors as you need. And as I said, we use the Rocket uh, Transfer Engine to move media between the different cloud providers as well as to different regions within that cloud. So with that being said, I'm gonna jump and show you the demo because I'm sure you're uh, uh, tired of seeing PowerPoint slides already. So I'm gonna escape out of this. I'm gonna bounce to my Bebop client, which I've already logged in for time's sake. And in my window here, these are all workstations set up in the cloud. Uh, these right here are set up on Amazon. These are set up in San Jose, which is uh, a few hundred miles north of where I am. But these systems have all been tuned to work best for VFX workflows. That means a lot of processors, that means a lot of GPU, and that means a boatload of RAM. So I'm going to pick a random one here. Let's go with lucky number seven. I'm gonna click this, and when I click this, it is spinning up the VM in the cloud. The reason it has to spin it up is because we only charge you per hour of usage. So if you use it for six hours a day, there's no reason to charge you for 24 hours of usage. So we spin it up when it's needed. It takes about two minutes. While that's spinning up, uh, over here on my left here, I have our rocket ingest and rocket download. And this allows us to push media uh, up and down to different folders. So I can browse folders, I can browse files, hit OK, and the files get transferred up to that cloud. But not only to the cloud, but to the storage you've been assigned. So there's no reason for you to go hunting for that media once you log into the virtual station. And the good thing is, everything is MD5 checksummed afterwards. So all the media is verified to have transferred correctly. 
We also track all this. So uh, if media is uploaded or downloaded that shouldn't have been, we track that through our back end, and I'll show that after the demo. So let me jump back into my desktops, and you'll see that my virtual machine is ready to go. So I'm going to click on this. Your screen might flicker for a second. This is me jumping into the virtual machine, which takes over my desktop, and then it's being shared through the uh, web conference software that we're using right now, which is Zoom. So your screen should have gone black, and now you'll see a Windows OS, which looks kind of strange because I'm used to working in a Mac environment. But that's not a huge deal because what we have on the dashboard that launches is a little button here called Enable Mac Keyboard. So that makes my thumb very happy because I can hit the command button all day long. A few minutes ago, I mentioned the fact that we can upload content uh, to your storage du jour on the cloud. We present all of that here. So the storage that you've been assigned. So I can hit the mount button and all the, uh, uh, the storage that you've been provisioned is right here. So no need to go to the network browse uh, and try and find your content on the network, it's there. Now, I also was not kidding uh, when I said uh, uh, that we give you a powerful machine. If I go to my properties here, Well, I'm trying to, <laughs> there we go. When I go to my properties here, you'll see that uh, we have uh, a 16 core machine with 122 gig of RAM. So you're not gonna run out of RAM anytime soon. I just had a question. Can you please fill the video screen and we can see more on less desktop? Uh, Melinda, my screen should be completely full screen at this point. Uh, if it's not full screen, please let me know in chat. So we're running Windows 2016. You'll see I have 122 gigs of RAM. And if I go to my device, if, uh, excuse me, if I go to my device manager, you'll see that here I have a 16 gig GPU, a Tesla M60. Okay, I'm getting some messages in the chat that you can only see the icons on the left. Uh, is that the case? I have a full screen here. Uh, I can certainly move my dashboard over a little bit if that helps. Belinda, your resolution may be small on your screen. Uh, but anyway, if anyone has any uh, more concerns, put those in chat and I'll try to adapt on the fly. So we have our storage mounted. We have our Mac keyboard mounted. If I want to share my screen, I can type someone's name in here and hit invite. But I think a, what I think uh, what a, a lot of you want to see uh, is Premiere. Uh, so Belinda, we can chat afterwards. It doesn't look like anyone else is having the issues. So. Uh, we'll address that afterwards. So I'm going to launch Premiere. I have an icon right here. I'm going to launch that. And as I launch this icon or click this icon, it's going to launch Premiere. Now, these, these aren't the only apps you can run. If I go to my start menu here, I have all of the apps that I've installed. And we support dozens of apps. We list them all on our website. So if there's an app that you want that you have not seen, let us know and we'll let you know if we've tested it. Once Premiere is launched, you'll see I have a project here. I'm gonna click that. And once it launches, you're probably gonna see someone that you've uh, uh, no doubt seen online before. He's kind of a blowhard. Yeah, that, that's me. That's me, but I'm not wearing that blazer today. So it's a little bit different. So when Premiere launches, this is a full version of Premiere. This isn't watered down. This isn't light. This isn't scaled down. This isn't a flash version. It's the complete version of Premiere. And in my timeline, as an example, I've got 4K ProRes, I've got a text layer, and I've got a real-time time code effect. I'm going to hit play. And what you probably noticed, if you're a Premiere editor, is that I have my green drop frames indicator here. I dropped zero frames, meaning I played back 4K material in real time in the cloud with a, gra with a uh, live graphic, live text, as well as an adjustment layer, which has a time code uh, effect on there. All this was done in real time, no rendering needed. Uh, if I needed to bring more media into here, I can go to my media browser and I can bring stuff in from the shared storage that we uploaded media to. I also can uh, use dynamic linking if I wanted to pull in a uh, file from After Effects or from Photoshop. I see we did have a question in chat regarding, is Photoshop now available for all users from Nathan? Yes, as long as you have a Creative Cloud license, uh, Photoshop uh, will be available to you. And lastly, inside here, I can go up to my window and take a look at my extensions. 
And this is where we can load Frame.io or any of the other plugins that you may need. Uh, so you're, you're in cloud, your uh, on Bebop workflow and your on Bebop experience mirrors what you're doing with your local machine as much as possible. And now, uh, because we're short on time, I'm gonna go to, I'm gonna uh, minimize this. And I'm going to jump into my, my web browser. And what we also have is what we call MCP. And all you Tron fans will get that reference. In our MCP, and I'll move this over so you can see this, Belinda. Uh, in, your, in our MCP, we track how many active users are on the system. We track what kind of projects they're working on. We also track what workstations are currently spun up, as well as their usage. So let's say you decide to farm out uh, remote editing to clients. Uh, or I'm sorry, remote editing to freelance users, you will get a report on how many hours they use. And because of that, you can track expenses and you can reconcile uh, remote uh, creatives versus how much are you're actually being billed for. <clears throat> As I also mentioned, we also uh, have uh, do transfer logs so we can see who uploaded what and who downloaded what. Lastly, we can download clients for Mac or OS, and we also have our support ticketing system, which makes everyone happy. Now, I wish I could go into more detail, but we have someone else on the call. We have Greg Cox, and let me bring up our, uh, my PowerPoint right here. Give me one second, there we go. We'll go back full screen. So that was the long and short of Bebop. Uh, we run all of those applications in the cloud, including Premiere. We get real-time performance uh, through the creative apps. But what we found is that a lot of clients say, great, I can edit no problem, I can export, I can render, but I need to submit. I need to send this to Netflix. I need to send this to ABC, CBS, uh, uh, NBC, et cetera. How do I make sure my files are compliant? And that's a really good question. So we, we decided to partner with Gray Meta. And Gray Meta is a company that has the Iris Player, which does QC for media formats and makes a perfect complement to the media that you're already creating on Bebop. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Greg Cox, the VP of Technical Product Solutions at Gray Meta. So Greg, take it away. Hey everyone, how are you doing? Uh, thanks for joining. Thank you, Michael, uh, for the, uh, the handoff there. And uh, for those of you that are familiar with Iris, um, obviously I think this will hit home uh, straight away. Uh, for those of you unfamiliar with Iris, I'll definitely be kind of going through, I would say some of the benefits of leveraging Iris, but not only leveraging Iris, Iris on the Bebop platform, um, which absolutely is becoming a huge topic of today. Um, as many of you know, uh, we're being asked to uh, you know, how do we get rid of this, this CapEx option? Or if it's not a CapEx problem, then maybe it's, it's, you know, what do we do with our overflow, so forth and so on, without incurring, you know, massive additional costs in adding more machines to the workflow? Well, a great thing uh, for Iris is that good old Bebop platform. Um, today, uh, Iris is definitely recognized as one of the best uh, in-class reference players on the market. Um, and as many of you know, and for those of you that don't know, Iris is a true reference player. Uh, we don't fudge content um, in order for you to look at it. We absolutely show you exactly what it is that came in. Uh, we won't drop frames or anything like that. Uh, we will simply play it back as it is, uh, which is why a lot of people like to use Iris because it's not kind of massaging it, uh, you know, to get it to play back. Uh, Greg, you may want to share your screen when time permits. Yeah, I'm doing that right now. Give me one second. There we go. There we go. Perfect. Sorry about that, guys. So just as I mentioned, we are absolutely true reference. Uh, we're an agnostic player, which is key. Uh, so basically, we'll accept content from anywhere that it comes. Uh, you know, we play nicely with all the systems out there. So many of you editors that are, you know, or, or packagers that are leveraging systems like Marquise, Transcoder, uh, Clipster, wherever it comes from, you can send it to us and we'll absolutely play back. Um, as a matter of fact, we're involved in many of the plug fests that are out there, um, which is really kind of an opportunity for us to sit down and make sure 
that that agnostic word kind of holds up, right? Uh, ensuring that packages from all different uh, creation systems uh, actually work in Iris. So just to be clear before we even move on from that, on that point, we are not a creation system. We are purely a, 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 a robust QC player, right? So if you are looking to create content, edit content, uh, that's not us. We live by the Hippocratic Oath. We will do no harm. And basically content comes in. And like I mentioned, you will see it as is. Um, redundancy is easy to, is easy to accomplish, uh, whether you're stacking up appliances or you're using a system, uh, a platform like Bebop. Um, you can absolutely spin up machines as needed uh, for redundancy. Um, uh, we leverage photon validation for all of those lovely folks that are doing deliveries uh, to Netflix. It's kind of like a a double whammy, if you will, to make sure that those rejection rates go down. Um, and one of the big things that we've been focused on in the more recent uh, uh, is HDR, right? Everybody's freaking out about HDR. You know, how do we get it out the door? How do we make sure that it's good? Iris has a, a number of tool sets uh, built in that allows you to uh, be more efficient with your HDR workflows. We support everything from HDR 10 to Dolby Vision. Um, and the only thing that we probably don't support today that we're going to support in the near future is HDR 10 plus. So we've got your HDR workflows uh, covered. Uh, we do have uh, some wonderful integrations with uh, automated QC systems out there whereby we can actually take in their reports. We can drop those points in on a timeline and you can actually jump to those points of interest um, at any time. You can annotate and determine whether or not there's something subjectively wrong with that content. Um, now, mind you, all of these things are wonderful things, and in most cases, people are putting it on their machines, they're building out machines, trying to spec machines, and figure out kind of, you know, what it is that they need to do in order to do this. Obviously, there's a cost associated with that. Um, we have people that are using our reference appliance, um, our Q-series, D-series, or our S-series appliance, and at the end of the day, you know, maybe you don't have that budget in order to build out this massive room, uh, you know, with tons and tons of, of stations. Well, Bebop is absolutely, I would say, the perfect answer uh, to that. Now, mind you, uh, one of the things that we always tell people, and those of you that are familiar with Iris, is that Iris is very CPU intensive. In other words, when you're decoding J2Ks and running with IMFs, looking at DPX images or EXR 16-bit TIFF, or whatever the case may be, there's a lot of resource that comes into play. And that's the reason why we recommend, in most cases on our standard server, 56 logical threads. So the question is, well, how do I build that out? Well, you come to end up finding that it's super duper expensive. Well, in this particular instance with Bebop, Bebop can throw whatever horsepower you need at it, as Michael mentioned earlier. So Bebop is absolutely the perfect platform if you're looking to use all of the horsepower that Iris can put out for you. As many of you know, we have uh, multiple versions of Iris. Uh, we look at it as there's a version for everyone. Uh, so if you're looking to just do simple playback, uh, we have the Iris 4K player. Um, we have an IMF player, there's QC Pro, and then QC Pro with DHQC, which unlocks and unleashes all that HDR power, along with basically everything Dolby. So at the end of the day, you can you know, support up to Atmos, uh, up to a 916 configuration. Uh, you know, we have a number of different histograms that you can use, a line range that really kind of shows you, you know, where you're falling, I would say, over the line, if you will, or out of legal range as it relates to the HDR metadata. All in all, they're all great products and can all run in the environment uh, on Bebop's platform. Mind you, quite obviously, the resource would be different. Uh, as many of you know, uh, we don't leverage any kind of GPU um, at this moment, so we're very CPU intensive, and Bebop definitely, I would say, acts as a great kind of overflow. Or again, if you're not looking to incur uh, that CapEx um, and having hardware local to yourself, this is a great opportunity uh, to leverage their platform and get the most out of Iris, I would say. So with that said, I'll jump into a demo. So if you would hold on for one second. I'm gonna do a little switch here. So here's the Iris player. Um, some of you are familiar, some are not. Uh, it is uh, a, a, 
an easy to use tool, I would say, with a lot of, I would say, tools in the bucket, right? So- Excuse me, Greg, Greg, I'm, uh, I'm not seeing, uh, I'm, I'm seeing the slide deck. Ah, gotcha, hold on one second. That is because Are you seeing it now? Yes, I am. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Uh, sorry about that. It looks like I was just sharing the application. Okay, so here we have Iris. Uh, this is, you know, basically my standard docking layout. So that's the reason why you kind of see things configured here. But if I wanted to, or if you wanted to, if you had multiple screens or whatever the case may be, you can actually pull these things out, move them around. Uh, they are in fact modular. Uh, there we go. Uh, to open content, basically, you just simply open file, navigate to your piece of content, you can click play. Iris will always ask you where the location of that media is, if you want to pull in any ancillary data. And this is one of the powerful uh, things that a lot of people use Iris for, is to pull in multiple caption files. Uh, we allow you to play them simultaneously. So if you have multiple languages, whether it's French, Chinese, Mandarin, whatever it is, you can pull them in at the same time and you'll be able to look at them at the same time and determine if you have some, some sort of syncing issue of any kind or whatever the case may be. So as on the left-hand side over here under my asset metadata window, as you can see, I have all of my technical metadata. For those of you that are not familiar with IRIS, basically this is all the information that comes from the header of the file. We also add, I would say, a little bit of uh, secret sauce in the background, some media info, some proprietary stuff to actually pull out some of these values uh, to show them to you here. But nonetheless, this is all the information as it relates to your file, your audio tracks, uh, and your ancillary tracks that are embedded in the file. Uh, one of the things, you know, we mentioned about Netflix deliveries and so forth, um, a lot of people are actually leveraging uh, our templates. So we have metadata templates that you can kind of put on top of this. And the idea here being is that once you configure a template based on some known good file, any subsequent file that comes into play that does not align and or match whatever the requirements are that are specified here, basically we'll flag it as red and you know immediately that you have a, have a problem. So it's not even worth your time to actually go through looking at the file. So again, just a quick easy way of knowing you know, whether or not you have an issue um, some of the other things I'm sure many of you have seen in the past, uh, pretty straightforward stuff like with player control. We allow you to kind of click into the player and actually, you know, type in whatever time code uh, you need to type in there to jump in, in into a certain TC. Um, we allow you to actually scrub through the file. You can actually set markers in and out and actually play in between those files. Um, there's a lot of different tools here. Um, as you can see, we have a vector scope, a spectroscope, we have waveform monitoring, so forth and so on. I'm not gonna jump into the details um, you know, as it relates to those things, because that, that would be uh, a very long demo. Uh, so I definitely just wanna kind of touch on some of the, the, the more important stuff, or not, in, they're not any less important, but uh, some of the other things that I think that you all will be interested in. So we do have uh, audio waveforms that we will build. Um, and the reason why I'm bringing this up, because as you can see there, we just did a software analysis. Um, mind you, this is a short piece of content, yes, but you can see how quickly we actually did that analysis. Uh, so what's great is that on the Bebop platform, you'll be able to run through uh, audio analysis really, really fast. You can click this analyze button at any given time. It can be based on whether you're looking at EBR 128, 1770, one, two, and three, coming soon, dash four, um, or some custom set. Um, you can definitely run an analysis against that. We also allow you to do that versus the input and the output of the audio. The audio, the input being whatever is configured in the file, the output being whatever you've potentially mixed the file down to, right? So maybe you have a have a two-channel stereo uh, uh, that, that was mixed down from a 5.1, or whatever the case may be, you can come in and simply click analyze, and as you can see, that happens fairly quickly. So there's no more kind of, you know, run, running baseband to some device, uh, then going on lunch, and you know maybe having a smoke break or whatever the case may be coming back and then hopefully your video is done and you have some some numbers there we actually do that fairly quickly and again it's one of those things that can easily be run on the bebop platform uh we have a routing panel uh we have all kinds of wonderful tools as it relates to qc um 
as it relates to HDR, uh, we will in fact read any HDR metadata that comes in over the file. We can do an internal simulation. So if I come here in, in options, I go into HDR, we actually have the ability to force content to an SC2084 or to an HLG, whatever the case may be. And we can actually mathematically correct, mathematically and correctly display that in screen. We have the ability to manipulate those HDR captions. Uh, we can leverage uh, with the frame overlays, you can kind of change what the colors are, so forth and so on, so that when you are running your line histogram, um, you can actually see kind of what that looks like while it's playing and see things going out of range, in range, so forth and so on. Um, so again, great powerful tool, but what I will say is all, all these things that I'm running, um, even some in the background here, um, these things are absolutely CPU intensive, right? So again, in most cases, to run this with all the features, you know, turned on, uh, we typically recommend our appliance. And today we still stand by that. It's a, it's a specific appliance that's geared to do what it's supposed to do. But as we all know, a lot of us are struggling with, with that whole uh, CapEx versus OpEx. Those of you looking to move to OpEx, hey, you know, we have a, we have a solution for you. And, and definitely uh, partnering with Bebop and uh, running our machine in their environment has definitely proven to be, I would say, uh, an efficient way of getting things done. Again, if you have some overflow or whatever the case may be, um, it's a unique and great opportunity to kind of uh, leverage that system. So I will. Now jump to uh, how to buy, oh, whoa. Was that you, Michael? Yes, it was. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I'm going to turn it back over to Michael, and uh, we're going to review as you know how you actually buy Iris on Bebop. Thanks, Greg. I, one of the things I, I think is very important is uh, I think we're all aware of the explosion of content uh, uh, on Netflix. Obviously, what Amazon is doing, and then the forthcoming uh, Disney uh, uh, VOD push. And a lot of these VOD platforms are far and away uh, have larger and more technical requirements than you would find from the usual you know, broadcast outlets. And that's why QC is so important because we're dealing with IMF packages, we're dealing with uh, uh, HDR uh, media and the HDR can be in any one of the standards. Uh, and I think all of us know that, that getting rejected content uh, can be not only a financial bite, but also a time bite. So uh, utilizing uh, Iris tech or uh, gray meta technologies, Iris in particular, to QC these files to make sure that your deliverable is on par with what it's supposed to be, uh, we're finding is just invaluable. Uh, now, uh, as uh, Greg pointed out, the whole CapEx versus OpEx model, um, how do you buy Iris on Bebop? Well, Bebop is a big fan of the BYOL model, uh, and that's bring your own license. So if you wanted to run ISIS, or excuse me, Iris on Bebop, you would contact Gray Meta, uh, you would buy the uh, license from Gray Meta, and then we would deploy that on the Bebop platform uh, that you would also purchase from us. So you'd get the platform from us, uh, you'd get the license from Gray Meta, and then we would run that on Bebop. And we would walk you through that in addition, or in a, uh, we would walk you through how to use Iris, uh, as well as uh, uh, getting Gray Meta involved to help you with that as well. Uh, we're very flexible on the pricing. And what I mean by that is, if it works better for you to do monthly or quarterly or yearly, we can do something like that as well. Um, and, and the fact that we give you the metrics on how all of these apps are used and how the machines are used, uh, makes it very easy to calculate what your cost is going to be on a month-to-month -month, uh, basis. And I'm trying to skip forward. Let's try this again. There we go. So we have a special offer. Uh, for everyone that's on the call right now, you can test drive the, uh, the Iris software on the Bebop Cloud platform. Uh, you get a two-week free trial of Iris. Uh, so you can QC all of that media that you need to deliver. Uh, we're offering that for you uh, as long as you sign up for Bebop. We'll give that to you. We'll work with Gray Meta and we'll get Iris installed. Uh, and you'll be able to kick the tires on both Bebop and Iris. Uh, so uh, feel free to get in touch with us. Uh, and as long as you sign up for Bebop, uh, we could get that going for you. 
Now it's time for Q&A. So all those questions that you wanted to, to hit us up with during the presentation, but couldn't, uh, you can ask now. And we have our marketing coordinator, Chris, on the line. And I think Chris is going to uh, read off some questions that came in, not only from the Q&A tab, uh, but also from emails and social media. So Chris? Thanks, Michael. And uh, thank you, Greg. Uh, again, uh, anybody who has any questions, make sure you just put them in the Q&A. Uh, we'll try to get to as many as we can here. Uh, if for whatever reason we don't get your question uh, on today's webinar, uh, one of us will, will be sure to follow up with you afterwards. Um, first question looks like uh, this will be for you, Greg. Uh, can Iris play back DCP content? Uh, thanks, Chris. Uh, as a matter of fact, it can. Uh, as we have a number of different clients out there actually leveraging Iris uh, in a uh, screening room environment, I would say. Um, and basically, uh, they're leveraging the SDI uh, capabilities of Iris. Today, we support uh, the uh, Blackmagic uh, 12G Extreme 4K, along with the Aja Kona 4, Kona 5, and Corvid cards. Um, and we also support the, uh, the Bluefish Neutron card as well. So absolutely, uh, we support DCP. We support both encrypted and unencrypted DCP. Uh, we also have the ability to uh, uh, host a certificate locally. Um, so you can actually decrypt your DCP and manage uh, uh, the, the keys locally. Awesome, thank you, Greg. Um, okay, the next question we have here is, how much bandwidth do I need to QC a 30-minute TV episode? I, I, uh, Greg, I think you're best suited for this. I presume for throughput, uh, the question is uh, storage. Uh, because uh, the way Bebop works is that everything that's shown on screen, um, only the pixels that have changed are what gets fed down to the Bebop client, uh, which is on your desktop. Uh, so that can range anywhere from 20 megabits a second, which is about a third or a quarter of what uh, home internet bandwidth is, up to about 50 or 60 megabits a second. Um, and that uh, is per monitor. But when we talk about storage and playing back those files for QC, uh, Greg, I think you would probably have a better grasp on that. Yeah, so in most cases, uh, we, how would you say, uh, in, in our reference appliance, right, we'll, we'll, we'll install a, multi a multitude of SSD drives. And the idea there is that we're using the overall bandwidth of those drives. So if, if you're looking for massive bandwidth, in most cases, um, you know, we're looking at three gigabits per second per drive. So effectively uh to play back 30 which what was it a 30 minute show uh yeah that's correct great 30 minute show yeah I'm, I'm suspecting that it'd be very low i mean you should be able to do that with 18 megabits per second with depending on you know uh whether it's 4k whether it's hd or whatever the case may be there are other considerations but you should absolutely be able to play that back uh fairly easily Awesome. Um, okay, so we have uh, we have another one here. It says, uh, "Is DaVinci Resolve supported?" Seems like I saw the icon on your VM startup screen, uh, but don't see it on your website. Oh, I appreciate the eagle eyes on that one. Uh, there's two answers to that. The first answer is from a technical perspective, Resolve runs. That includes the free version as well as the studio version. Uh, what we're currently testing and currently working with is um, what are we doing in terms of the DaVinci control panels, whether it's the full version or whether it's a tangent or something else. So while the core functionality resolve is fantastic and it works and we can allocate multiple GPUs, there's still a few more uh, uh, T's to cross and I's to dot so we can uh, uh, say that it works flawlessly. Uh, but the application runs fine. Uh, we're just working on a few things on the back end. Perfect. Thank you, Michael. Um, okay, uh, this is, this looks like this is a pretty quick, low-hanging one uh, for you, actually, Michael. Uh, is Photoshop available for all users? Good question. Uh, Photoshop is available provided that the end user or your company has a Creative Cloud license that includes 
Photoshop. As you know, you uh, subscribe to Creative Cloud and you either get the entire suite or you go with groups of apps, etc. So when you log into Bebop, you can put in your Creative Cloud credentials. And if your account supports Premiere, uh, we can install it on your system and you can run it. So while we don't make it available to everyone because not everyone has a license, if you have a license, it runs flawlessly. Uh, and that includes a lot of the other Creative Cloud app, uh, apps as well, including Illustrator and, and Prelude and, and of course, Premiere. Awesome. Um, and it looks like uh, we have just one final question, uh, unless anybody has uh, anything else they would like to ask. Uh, now would be the time to put it in the uh, Q&A uh, box. Um, but it looks like uh, somebody would like to know a ballpark budget for storage. Ballpark budget for storage. Uh, let me see if I, that's kind of nebulous, but let me, if this is directed towards Bebop, let me see if I can answer that. Um, if you've done any research into cloud storage, Cloud storage can take many different forms, whether it's something like Backblaze, right, which is just storage, or we talk about Amazon or Azure and, and whether they're using magnetic disks or they're using SSDs, et cetera, the price can fluctuate uh, dramatically. It also changes depending on what region you're in, whether you're overseas or here in the States. Uh, Bebop tends to use uh, uh, faster SSD storage so we can get the hundreds of megabytes a second needed for applications like Iris or for you know, fat codecs like ProRes, uh, et cetera. So it's, it's kind of difficult to give a price on that. Um, uh, what we find, and this is completely ballpark, is that it runs about $150 to $200 per terabyte. Um, and that, uh, again, uh, is completely uh, 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 changes depending on what region. It depends on if you're Azure, GCP. It depends if you're doing snapshotting. Uh, if you're dealing with Amazon, are you dealing with egress charges? So there's a lot of asterisks next to that but usually a few hundred dollars per terabyte is a good ballpark number. And of course, us here at Bebop, and I'm sure Gray Meta as well, are happy to go through estimations with you uh, and find out what kind of storage you need, not only in capacity, but throughput. Uh, cloud storage is based on not only capacity, but throughput as well, and throughputs require servers. So uh, again, it's kind of a moving target with a lot of options, uh, but we're happy to go through that, those numbers with you. Uh, and find a happy medium between uh, capacity and throughput. Thank you, Michael. It looks like we've had a couple more questions just trickle in here. Uh, so uh, here we have one that says, uh, will, I, will I be able to use all Iris features in Bebop or are there any limitations? So that's a, actually a really good question. So just like I mentioned earlier, there are multiple flavors of Iris. Uh, it's about figuring out which one uh, suits your needs. Um, and once you determine which one you need, uh, basically we can, we can hand that over to Bebop and Bebop will configure um, an instance that is specific to those needs. And that relates to horsepower, right? So um, the answer is yes, um, but the answer is yes, specific to whatever the needs are uh, per the version of Iris that you might be looking to use. Um, you, but there are no limitations outside of that. Um, you should be able to use all the features as they relate to each particular individual uh, version. Great, thank you, Greg. Uh, and it looks like we have an, uh, another one here uh, for you. Uh, how, is Iris, how does Iris differ from uh, Baton, Telestream, et cetera? Uh, so basically there, uh, one thing that we are not is an automated QC system. So basically you don't point us at any storage location uh, that might be connected in Bebop and we're not gonna monitor a folder and look at you know thousands or hundreds of files coming in, run some analysis and then provide a report for you. Uh, basically we do, however, uh, integrate well with them. So like I mentioned earlier, we will take those QC reports, we can ingest them, put, put uh, points on a timeline, right? Those points of interest, you can click on them and then determine whether or not you have um, an issue uh, as we know. A lot of those systems will put out uh, false positives. Um, so Iris is definitely a great tool, um, has been for a long time with determining uh, kind of, or giving you, right, a view as to whether or not uh, those things are subjectively passable or if they are in fact hard issues uh, that, you, that you may have with your content. So 
at the end of the day, uh, again, we are different from those systems. However, we do work really well with those systems. Thank you, Greg. Um, and it looks like that's actually all the questions we have in the queue. So I'll hand it back over to you, Michael, and let you uh, wrap things up. Excellent. Well, you can tell by this chart that we've reached the end of our time together here, neighbors. Uh, I appreciate everyone getting in contact or uh, tuning into the webinar. And we invite you, reach out ask questions, let us talk about workflow, let's wax geek philosophic, uh, and let's see what we can do on the cloud together. Again, my name is Michael Thomas uh, with Bebop Technologies. Uh, on behalf of Bebop, as well as Gray Meta, uh, thank you so much for tuning in, and this will be on demand soon. Thank you. <laughs>